you. Well, we're kicking off a new series this month called In the Middle. And uh, I always think about February as the month of love. And so it seems fitting that we would talk about the kind of love that God uh, wants us to have for each other. I can remember uh, my grandfather. He wasn't a very loving person. He's still alive today. He hasn't passed away or anything, but, uh, and he still isn't. He's kind of a rough guy. He was always raised kind of rough. He had like seven or eight brothers and sisters. He was the youngest, and so he was always picked on. And, uh, and so he would tell me about how he would always have to fight, you know, his brothers. They would always pick on him, and he would always have to fight them for, for everything that he could get or have. And so he tells, me, he tells me this, right? We're Christians, we're raised in the church, and I say Christians in the loosest term. We're Christians, we're raised in the church, and uh, so I go to Sunday school and church every Sunday, and he's you know, telling me about how he used to fight all the time as a kid, and he's almost as if like this is a good thing. And one particular time when he was a young man, he told me they had this tradition. So my grandfather is in his 80s, and some of you uh, who are here this morning, you might remember this. It might, it might have just been an Ohio thing, right? I'm from Ohio, southeast Ohio. And so they had this tradition where if they wanted to fight somebody, their circle of friends would gather together outside, and one person would stand in the middle with a stick on his shoulder, and the other person, what they were supposed to do is when they entered the circle, they were to walk up and knock the stick off his shoulder, And then in return, he would push you, and then the fight could actually happen. So they had traditions, and they had rules. They had certain standards for how you're going to fight. Well, my grandfather told me this. He said, look, Rick, the first punch is always half the battle. And he's telling me this, and he says, so I walked up into the circle, and he had the stick on his shoulder, and I walked up, and I just punched him right in the mouth, and it was all over with. And so I'm like, wow, Grandpa, you know, that's kind of a cool thing. So I adopted that mentality. Now remember, I'm a Christian, right, in the church. I adopted that mentality. It was, look, the first punch, you win half the battle. And sometimes you can even just uh, finish the battle before it even starts. And so I would get in fights in high school, and I would always remember what my grandfather told me. And look, I'm professing to be a Jesus follower, right? And so I'm really proud, and I laugh. I'm really proud of the kind of person that I've become. And I'm fighting kids in high school because I was raised in a scrappy family, and so I'd always make sure I'd get the first punch in. And then when I grew up and became a little bit older and I, you know, graduated high school, I dropped my fists and I started using my words. And so I thought, well, when I get married or when I have a dispute in the church, right, you always want to get the first punch out. And so you end up saying things, and you try to hurt the person as much as possible, as bad as you can, because after all, it's about winning the battle rather than doing what is right. And so now that I look back, I'm so deeply ashamed of those young kids that I heard and the fights that I had, because I know that I've ruined the reputation of Christ. I didn't carry out the basic commands that Jesus instructed me to carry out. If you remember from last month, We talked about the greatest thing that we can do in 2019, and that's to love God with everything that we are. But if you remember the first message that we talked about, the man asked Jesus this question, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I've ruined my reputation with those people that I hurt. I blasphemed the name of Christ because I didn't maintain the kind of integrity that I was supposed to have. And then I even carried that principle of hurting the person the worst rather than doing good to my neighbor and loving them with the kind of love that God instructed me to have. Today, rather than having a love that kills and hurts and harms people around us, I want to talk about a love that compromises, a love that meets people in the middle and finds common ground so that we can carry out one of the greatest things that we will ever do in this life, and that's to love people the way that we love God. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read verses 21 through 26 this morning. And here is Jesus preaching probably what is considered one of the greatest pieces of literature ever known to man. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's one of the best sermons that we could ever look to in the Bible. If you've never read the Sermon on the Mount, I highly encourage you, buy a Bible, look at it for free online, read the Sermon on the Mount. It basically can be summarized as this. The Sermon on the Mount was Jesus instructing people of how to live a life that is worthy and pleasing to God. If you want to go out and live a life that is pleasing to God, look at the Sermon on the Mount and follow these teachings. Now, I think that we have all grown up with certain moral standards that are grounded in culture rather than Christ. Just like I was as a young man, you go out and you hit first so that you can win the fight. 
And that's something that I carried over into my Christianity. And I bet if you were to pause and you were to think about yourself, things that you heard from your parents or your grandparents, or maybe you even heard growing up in the church, I bet that there are things that you were raised with that you thought was right, but now you know was dead wrong. Now you know has actually prohibited you, prohibited you from becoming the person that God wanted you to be. And I want you to think about those traditions. I want you to think about those teachings. And I want you to captivate those things that you've learned. And I want you to compare them with what we're going to read about in the scriptures. You see, here is Jesus teaching thousands of people, right? Maybe even tens of thousands of people. He's sitting up on a mountainside and he's instructing all these people who are beginning to say, hey, I wonder if this guy is the Messiah, the one that we have waited for all of this time. I wonder if Jesus is it. And so you've got normal people that are of Jewish, you know, religion, but then you also have the teachers, the scribes, the Pharisees, the people who are really well known as religious teachers of the time, and they're all sitting there and they're listening to Jesus. And look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. He points this very important thing out to us. Here's what he says. He says, this is, this is what I say to you. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment, you're sitting there in the audience, and you're a teacher, you're a Pharisee, you're a scribe, you're somebody who actually knows the law, and Jesus looks out at everyone else, and then he says, unless you are willing to be more righteous than they, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Can you imagine how that would make you feel? That would be like if my grandfather was here today and I said, unless you are better than this man, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That would be a very convicting thing to hear, would it not? And so here are these people, supposed to be the teachers and the religious leaders of the law, and they are doing the bare minimum, and Jesus says, look, the law was meant to be a whole lot more than what they're telling you. And unless your righteousness surpasses them, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is going to challenge them this uh, this morning, and he's going to challenge us as well. What kind of life are we to live that is pleasing towards God? You see, they had rules. They had stipulations. They had laws. They had a strict way of life. And here's the good news. The good news is, is if you could keep the entire law, you would get to go to heaven. But there's bad news. And what do you think the bad news is? No one can keep it. And so here is Jesus instructing them about the kingdom of God. He's telling them about the law of God. And he's sitting down and he's teaching all these people who know basically everything he's going to say. And look what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. He says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now, murder is a serious issue. It was a serious issue in the Old Testament, it is a serious issue today. We see online or on the news about people um, lifting up and enabling our society to murder people who can't even defend themselves of the unborn. There have been a few bills that have been been proposed in New York, one in Virginia, uh, about late-term abortions. And it is something that God is against. It is something that we should be against. It is something that we should stand up against. And you know a culture is so morally deprived of just basic decency when you can propose a bill that says you can kill an unborn child while at the same time saving caterpillars. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. People have lost their moral compass if this is where we're going to be as a society. And here is Jesus instructing us that it is wrong to commit murder. Now, if you can imagine yourself sitting in this audience as a Pharisee, It would be something that you would jump up and you would say, amen, (laughs) right? I mean, sometimes we hear things like that in church where we just can't help it. It is the truth, and we want to jump up, and we say amen. This was a command uh, that was commanded in Exodus chapter 20, and he said, thou shall not kill. I mean, it was pretty pretty basic. Now, murder is different um, than killing. Sometimes we have to have self-defense. If somebody breaks into my home, and tries to kill my family, I am responsible for defending their lives, and there's nothing wrong with self-defense. The Bible says that there's nothing wrong with capital punishment. It was a basic command in Genesis chapter 9. If you kill someone, they will kill you back. (laughs) That's the basic uh, going rate for what it's like to be a murderer. And so capital punishment is not the same thing as murder. Self-defense is not the same thing as murder. War is not the same thing as murder. Murder is plotted, it is planned, it is malicious, and it is evil to the core. 
It was the first crime committed by Cain who murdered his brother Abel, and God gave Cain grace. And the real issue is this. America doesn't have a homicide problem. We don't have a murder problem. We have a heart issue. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and slanders. That's the real issue. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And that's what this next month is going to be all about. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Are you loving God with everything that you are? And are you loving your neighbor as you love yourself? I can honestly say that I do not want somebody to kill me for some unknown reason. And I hope that you feel the exact same way. And so here are these religious leaders. They're sitting down and they're listening to Jesus and they have their holy robes on because they got to look better than everyone else and be better than everyone else. And Jesus quotes this verse. And I like to imagine in my mind, they stand up and they look around at everybody else. They're saying, see, all right, maybe this guy isn't as bad as what we thought. I mean, you know, he was claiming to be the Messiah and everything. And he was kind of like, you know, rebuking us in some sense. But here he's quoting the Old Testament. And after all, we are for the Old Testament. And so he quotes this verse and they stand up and they say, amen, Jesus, and they begin to smile at all the people around them. They say, see, isn't this what we've been telling you in synagogue every Saturday when you come to Sunday school and to church? We've been telling you, thou shall not kill. And who's best at not killing people? It is I, (laughs) okay? Because they hadn't murdered anyone. Now, this is really important to understanding this passage of scripture. So, The Old Testament was written in basically one language, Hebrew. There's some Aramaic in there as well. The problem was the Jewish people, they didn't know Hebrew. It was a dead language by the time Jesus came along. And so the only people who could truly understand the law were the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders and the teachers. They could read Hebrew. They could give the proper interpretation. It gave them immense power and persuasion over the people because they were able to say, hey, look, This is what it means. No, 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 you're wrong. We are the religious leaders. We're the ones who have been trained in Hebrew. We know the correct interpretation. You've got it wrong. We've got it right. Listen to us. But you know what the problem is with that? Some of us deal with this today in in our own denominations. The problem is that man is evil. We are wicked. We are corrupt. And when we try to possess the truth, when we try to say, hey, we're the only ones who know the right way, you've got to follow everything that we follow, and we appeal to authority, which is a fallacy, by the way, we begin to manipulate the scriptures to meet our own gain, and that's exactly what the Pharisees did. And so notice what Jesus said in verse 21. You have heard that the ancients have told you. In other words, this is the tradition This is the interpretation. This is what we've always taught you. And the Pharisees are standing up. They're saying, hey, see, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. This is exactly what we've told you all along. We have been right the whole time. Aren't you glad you've listened and followed us? But remember in verse 20, Jesus pointed them out and says, unless your righteousness surpasses them, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I remember having a conversation with a friend in high school And I said, hey, man, if you died today, where do you think you'd go? And, of course, what was his answer? Well, you know, I've never murdered anybody or anything like that. I mean, I probably would go to heaven. Yeah, I think I'd go to heaven. And I said, oh, okay. And I opened up to Matthew chapter 5, and I read him this passage of Scripture. What about you? If you were to die today, where do you think you would go? Do you view yourself as a good person? I mean, we do that, don't we? I've never murdered anybody. You know, I've never stolen a bunch of money. You know, maybe a few things that didn't belong to me, a pen or a pencil. But I've never really done anything bad, really, really evil, right? I mean, you got all these people in prison. They've done all kinds of, uh, of terrible stuff. I am not like them. I'm, I, I'm a decent person by the standard of society. And yet there's a bill passed in Virginia that legalizes late-term abortion and saves caterpillars. It is a moral compass that is out of whack. It is off base. It is lost true north. That's what happened to the Pharisees. And so Jesus is saying, this is what you've heard. This is what you've learned. Here's what's been passed down to you. But if we are going to live a life pleasing to God, Jesus says in verse 22, but I say unto you. Look what he says in verse 22. But I say unto you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. In other words, if you are angry with your brother without a cause, you're going to be guilty. 
Now, anger is a very important human emotion, okay? Anger itself is not evil. After all, we can do incredible things with anger. I mean, we can stand up to these bills that are trying to be passed. We can fight for the right to life, those who don't have a chance to fight for themselves. I mean, anger can be the fuel that causes us to stand up and be pro-life. But there's a problem. Anger can affect us. You see, anger is a touchy issue, not just because of what man can do to it, but for what it can do to man. And we have to be careful. And so here are the Pharisees saying, hey, I've never murdered anybody. And Jesus says, ah, but even if you're angry without a cause, you are guilty. Anger can be sinful because it becomes out of selfishness. When we sin, we can become more concerned with being right rather than doing right. When our hearts are full of anger, we lash out with our words, we get the first punch in, we want them to lose and us to win, and it's no longer about doing the right thing, it's about being right. And we've missed the point. The Pharisees were so lost in their morality that they only cared about being right rather than doing right. They put the law, the law, they lost the whole integrity and spirit of the law to, it's just a list of rules that you keep, and they, they left the heart out of it. And so here's Jesus coming along, and he says, oh no, it's not about just not murdering somebody, but even if you are angry without a cause, you are guilty. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Here's the problem. When we are angry without a cause, we speak thoughtless, causeless, and we hurt people. And so we need to get our anger in right perspective. Jesus is saying, look, if you want to live a life pleasing to God, put your anger in control. Don't let your anger be in control of you. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18 says this, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. An angry person is like a bull in a china shop. They wreak havoc everywhere. Destruction is everywhere they go. Now, how do I know if I've got sinful anger? It's a simple question. Am I doing good to my neighbor? When I act out in my, in my anger, is it to their benefit? And am, I, am I doing them good? Am I profiting them? Am I helping them? Am I aiding them? Or is it more about me being right and me being offended? Where's your anger at this morning? Are you guilty, in other words, before God? Are you angry without a cause? Now, this week in my sermon preparation, I sat down with my wife and I said, Angel, have we ever argued about something really, really stupid, like just totally causeless? What's something that sticks out in your mind? She goes, I don't know. There's just so many. <laughs> I mean, come on, married couples. You cannot lie to say you have never argued over some, and I'm talking about hardcore, like two to three hour arguments over things that are really, really, really stupid. All right? Angel went out and got towels, and stupid me. You know what I said? Huh, why'd you pick that color? <laughs> you are so ungrateful. I mean, we just started going at it, right? I mean, we do stuff that's stupid all the time. We can be totally thoughtless and careless, and we fight about stuff that just doesn't matter. To be angry without a cause, I mean, let's put things in perspective, guys. Toilet paper and towels, color on the walls, styles, these things don't matter. It's the heart issues that are, the, are the basic of who we are. These are the things that really, really matter. And so Jesus goes on to say in verse 22, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. So here are the Pharisees teaching the law and they're passing on their traditions. Just don't murder anybody, and you're a good person. And Jesus says, oh no, if you're angry without a cause, and if you yell slanderous words at people, you are going to be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now maybe some of your translations have raka, right? That was the actual word that they used. And maybe some of your translations have the Sanhedrin Council. Here's what we need to know. The Supreme Court or the Sanhedrin Council was only reserved for people who were hardcore criminals, like murderers. And Jesus says, if you slander people, you are guilty like a murderer before the Supreme Court. You see, Jesus is getting down deep into the heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if we are going to be serious about living a life that is pleasing to God, we need to put our anger in check. We need to have a love that's willing to compromise and reconcile and meet people in the middle on common ground and love them as we love ourselves. That's the challenge this morning. 
He goes on to say in verse 22, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. Do you see the dangers of anger? Do you see how it can destroy not only the people around us, but even our own selves? How far are you willing to let your unchecked anger go? How long are you willing to argue and complain about things that really, at the end of the day, they don't matter? You see, the Bible is very clear. Murderers cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's in Revelation chapter 22. But yet here's Jesus saying, people who have unchecked anger, who've missed the entire spirit of the law, you are in danger. And so if we're angry with our parents or with our kids or with our spouses or with our church family members or with people in our community or with senators or governors who try to pass bills that at the end of the day is murder, we can't be guilty of ungodly anger. We can't be guilty of sinful anger. And so here are the once proud Pharisees and scribes. They were sitting up, smiling, saying amen at verse 21. And when Jesus says verse 22, the smile is wiped off their face and they sit down and they cross their arms and then they listen because they know they've missed the point. And sometimes we can miss the point as well. Why? Because we're selfish, because we're proud, because we're sinful, because we don't put the things of God first. And isn't it amazing when we get our vertical relationship with God right, when we are loving him with everything that we are, all of a sudden our horizontal relationships start to work out. When we have the things of God in our heart and in our mind, we start to love people as we would love ourselves. You see, their traditional interpretation of the law and of morality, it fell way short of the glory of God. And they were so busy, the Pharisees, condemning the murderers around them that they failed to look in their own heart at their unchecked anger, at their slanderous accusations, at their unbridled rage. And they were angry with the people around them. You see, the law didn't fail the Pharisees. The Pharisees failed the law. And the New Testament doesn't fail us as Christians. But we can fail it if we're unwilling to live a life worthy of God. Psalms chapter 37 verse 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, for it leads only to evil doing. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, which means to scream at each other, right? I've been guilty of this. Angel and I, I'm just going to let you know. We've yelled at each other. I've yelled at my parents. I've yelled at my kids. Clamor. It means to just a loud, loud noise from your mouth. He says, put it away. Don't even let it be mentioned among you. Put away malice and evil intentions from your heart. James, he put it like this in James chapter 1, verse 19. He gives us the reason why we should put away human anger. Here's what he says. This you know, and we all know this, okay? Some of the best sermons aren't things that are new. They're things that we need to be reminded on. He says, this you know, my beloved brethren. Everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You know, a lot of us like to quote Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, in your anger, do not sin. And I, I talked to a, a person one time, called him up on the phone, very, very angry, very, very upset. I said, hey, man, let's, let's not be angry. I'm allowed to be angry. That's what he said. And I said, well, James says human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Let's not take scripture farther than what it was meant to be taken. Let's not man manipulate it on our own behalf. Why? Because we want to be right rather than doing what is right. Human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Do you know how hard it is to have the righteous anger of God? It is a very, very difficult thing. Number one, because we're corrupt and we see things through our own selfish lens. And so let these scriptures ring true to you. Let this issue of anger and lacking love for the other person. Let it speak to your heart and to your mind and motivate you to captivate it and bring it under subjection to follow after Jesus. We need to have a love that compromises. And the only way we'll ever fully be able to overcome our ungodly anger is to pursue and chase after love. You know how hard it is to have a close fist towards someone when your hand is open, shaking their hand in fellowship? It's really hard, you can't have a closed fist if your hand is busy shaking somebody else's hand. You know how hard it is to strike someone when your arms are wrapped around them in love, when you're giving them a hug? It's difficult. In fact, I would say it's near impossible. 
When we're busy loving people as we are loving ourselves, we will find ourselves fulfilling the greatest thing that we can do, love God and love people. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. And so let's look at what Jesus has to say. He gives us some illustrations, some practical examples of how, what it looks like for a person to overcome their ungodly anger. Here's the first one. In verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore, now that you know that this is true, that it's not just about not murdering people, but it's about your heart, he says, Therefore, if you are presenting an, uh, your offering at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. Here's the danger of unbridled anger. Here's the danger of not loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, is it can kill our relationship with God. Is that something that you're willing to do? Are you willing to let your relationship with God be killed because you haven't reconciled with your brother or your sister in the Lord or with somebody in your own household? You see, the Jews were not to appear before God when they went to worship empty-handed. That's what we do. Every Sunday morning when we come together, we worship God, and we're not empty-handed. We offer him our, our spiritual selves. We worship him. We praise him. We give money back to him. We just did that a few moments ago. I mean, we should have something to give to the Lord. After all, he is worthy. And it was the same thing with the Jews. And they would bring their sacrifice, and they had this large altar, and it was, it was really brutal, okay? They actually had to kill the animal themselves and place it on the altar to be burnt. And that was to be a reminder of how terrible sin really is, but how great God's mercy is. It's the same thing that we do with the Lord's Supper. We break bread, we take the cup, and that reminds us of the penalty and the, the punishment of our sin. It was placed upon Jesus, right? And so they had to come and they had to give their gift unto God, but the whole point of the offering was a reminder of sin. And so here I can imagine them, they have that animal right there, they're getting ready to sacrifice it on the altar, and they're confessing their sin to God, and they're saying, God, please overlook my sin. Please overlook my sin. And they're going through these things and their struggles, and then something comes to their mind. Their brother has a legitimate cause and case against them, and they're not reconciled. I mean, look, we're not talking about petty indifferences of so-and-so hurt my feelings because they didn't shake my hand. We're talking about legal issues, things that you know that are unreconciled with your brother. You had a terrible fight, and you said things that you didn't mean to say, and you slandered them, and you were angry with them, and that wasn't reconciled, and you know it. And here's what Jesus says. Your sacrifice that you're getting ready to offer to God isn't acceptable until you reconcile with your brother. Now think about that, spouses. You ever come to church angry and not reconciled? Guilty, I have. And then I have to preach and I feel like a total moron and a fake and a fraud. I'm just being honest with you. It's terrible. It's terrible. God wants reconciliation. And so I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to anybody else. I am just as guilty of ungodly anger as the next person. But we are called to reconcile. We are called to make peace. We are called to meet people in the middle on common ground and to reconcile to each other, to compromise. And so if you have wronged someone, we are to seek out reconciliation. How can God accept our worship if we know that we've wronged someone? If you know that your brother has a legitimate issue with you, God says, look, go settle that. Go reconcile. Make peace. Move on. Because it's not worth your relationship with me. We can kill our relationship with God if we're not willing to share our hurt with people. Now look, we're not mind readers. I'm not a mind reader. Maybe I've hurt you. Maybe you've hurt me. Maybe you've hurt other people in this room. People don't know all the time when they've been hurt. So it's your responsibility to go to the person that has hurt you and say, hey, look, this hurt me. I have an issue. Let's reconcile. Let's come together because my relationship with God is more important than our division and our dissension with each other. That's what the gospel is calling us to do. You see, worship is not accepted by God from any worshiper who harbors basic disobedience to God's commands in his heart. Reconciliation is the supreme duty. It's what Jesus died for. That's what he wants us to do. Now, we could apply this principle to anything, right? For the Jews, it was a sacrifice for us. Take the Lord's Supper. Before you take the Lord's Supper, reconcile with your wife. Reconcile with your husband. Before you take the Lord's Supper, uh, why don't you, before you pray, go reconcile. Before you come and sing songs of worship, reconcile. Wrap your arm around the person next to you that you love and is the most important and say, hey, look, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I love you. And then worship God. 
That's, that's the basic teaching of Jesus. So here's the question. How many days, how many weeks, how many months, how many years have you let go by being at odds with your neighbor and not reconciling? Or maybe the real question is this. How long are you going to let your relationship with God die before you do the right thing? We are instructed to leave. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. And Paul says kind of the same thing in Romans. He says, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You know something I found to be true in the ministry? While I may be interested in reconciliation, sometimes other people aren't. And that's okay. But at least if I do everything in my power to reconcile with my brother, I am honoring God and my worship is accepted. Again, Romans 14, 19. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and for building up of one another. And so in other words, be quick about your reconciliation. Don't even present your offering to God. Leave right now and go and reconcile with somebody who has wronged you or go talk to somebody about you know that you've wronged. That's what God is telling us to do. And Jesus ends it with this in verse 25 and 26. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I say unto you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. Here's here's the real ultimate danger. It can cause us to end up in court if we don't check our anger. And not only that, it can cause us to be thrown into prison. You know how many people were in prison today because they've lashed out in their anger? They never checked it. They went off of their emotion. They were quick to act, slow to hear, and the anger put them in prison. They actually had these types of prisons where they were, they were prisons of reconciliation. If you had a debt that you owed somebody and you didn't pay it back, they could take you to the court and you would be thrown in jail. And here's the bad news. How are you going to pay back the debt if you're in prison? <laughs> How are you going to do that? It's impossible. You can't do it. And so let's apply that, apply that principle to us. We shouldn't let our anger and our pride blind us to where these people bring us before God and we kill our relationship with God and we cut him off ever before we reconcile and we live in a prison of anger and hatred and mean-spiritedness and harshness with everyone around us because we are so deeply consumed with murderous anger in our heart that it can't help but come out of our mouth and out of our actions. And every day we take one step farther away from God. One step farther away from God. How long? Are we willing? Hey, it happens to me all the time. You know, I got like Southern Ohio uh, accent, and so I'll say, seriously? And Siri will come on. Hey, Rick, what do you need? And I'm like, this is ridiculous. (laughs) And so she can pick up my voice with seriously, but then if you have ever gotten a voice text from me, I'm really, really sorry. I've accidentally cursed at people in voice text because of my Southern accent, so that's just a confession right there. But uh, hey, I get it. It happens all the time. So anyways, uh, I don't even know where I was. It distracted me. I get, I'm, like a, I'm like a dog with a squirrel, you know what I mean? It just, I get really easily distracted. Yeah, verse 26. So he says, he says, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. And so here they are in this debtor's prison. The law rewarded damages to the wrong party, not just what you owe, but now you've got to pay even more because of damages. And if you didn't pay in the debt, the court would hold you in prison until the debt was paid. And so here's, here's the main point, okay? There is no time to be lost. Don't live in the anger that kills. Live in the love that compromises and meets people in the middle and finds common ground and reconciles. Don't be willing to lose your relationship with the people around you and your relationship with God because you've been hurt. Share that hurt with somebody. Share that hurt with the person that hurt you. If you know that somebody has something against you, go to them. Give them a phone call. Talk it out. Reconcile. Work through it. I love this proverb. I couldn't help but share it with you this morning. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. He, this, is, this is wisdom. He says, If you have been trapped by the words of your lips and ensnared by the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, to free yourself. For you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Has that ever happened to you? You ever said something you didn't mean out of your anger? Yes, I have. To my wife, to my kids, to my family, to my friends, to my fellow servants in the church. I've done it. I'm guilty. Here's what he says. Go and humble yourself 
and press your plea with your neighbor. Allow no sleep to your eyes or slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the fowler's snare. You see, when we live in anger, we're trapped. We're trapped by our own hatred for the people around us. How do you set yourself free? Reconcile. Go to your brother. Love them as you love yourself. And so instead of having an anger that kills, we should have a love that compromises. Love meets in the middle, and it finds common ground. I'd like to end with...